Okay. So thank you to everybody for joining us for this, uh, for this little talk here. Um, we're going to start to try and do a regular science series for students that are in the PSC and ARC, and eventually we're going to open that up to some more people, hopefully. And the idea is to tell you about a project that we are involved in called NanoGrav. Uh, some of you guys have probably heard of it before. It stands for the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. And as PSC and ARC scholars that are helping us search for pulsars, they're helping us take data on pulsars, this is you know, a direct uh, use of the type of work that you guys are doing and something that you are contributing to uh, by helping us to find new pulsars and to take data on them. So we put this little talk together to just sort of introduce what NanoGrav is. Um, to tell you a little bit about who's involved and about the science that goes on. So hopefully in future talks, we're going to have more information about the specific research that people are doing in NanoGrav, more background on the type of science that we're doing, and you're going to have professors, grad students, and uh, a bunch of other great people who are going to be telling you about their experiences in the project. So I'm going to start off the little presentation here with so I'm giving you the punchline for the rest of the talk, so that if you don't remember anything else from this, that you hopefully you will remember, you will, you will remember this. That is, the nanograph is a collaboration of scientists, so it's not just any one person or any one institution. And the goal of the project is to directly detect and study gravitational waves using millisecond pulsars. And the whole reason we want to do that is because by looking at the universe, using gravitational waves, we're going to see and learn amazing new things that we would not otherwise have been able to learn um, by looking at the universe simply in the light that we see with our eyes or electromagnetic radiation of some other form. But now hopefully you guys have some questions after just hearing that little uh, introduction. Like, why is this a project which, which is worth doing? Why are the things that, we're, that we uh, stand to learn interesting? Uh, what are gravitational waves exactly? Um, how do we use pulsars for this project? Um, most of you guys already know what pulsars are, but we'll have a little bit of review of that too. And what exactly are we going to learn um, by doing this nanograph project? And so these are the questions that we're going to spend the rest of the time during the talk and trying to answer. So, I put this very beautiful picture up here. This is a Hubble picture. Um, people have probably seen great pictures like this. And I think that when a lot of people think about telescopes, they think about images like this. And pretty much everything that we have learned about the universe, um, aside from the planets in our, in our own solar system that we have actually traveled to physically or sent probes to, almost everything that we've learned about the universe has come to us by studying things that emit light. We've also learned some very valuable information by studying actual subatomic particles like protons that are emitted by very distant objects and that interact with our atmosphere. But most of astronomy focuses on the study of light. This is a beautiful picture um, that was taken in optical light, so the type of light that we see with our eyes. But light includes more than just what we see with our eyes. Light includes, for example, x-rays which is what this picture um, was taken in. It includes radio waves that pulsars emit. It includes infrared and ultraviolet and gamma rays. All of these are forms of electromagnetic radiation, and to an astronomer, they're all light. So it's the same basic phenomenon. So if an object doesn't emit light, and most of what we know about it, we would not have any way of learning. We can't send probes out to distant stars to actually collect samples. Um, and we really are reliant on information that is being sent to Earth. And so far, mostly all that we've been able to detect is light. But this is a really exciting time in astronomy right now, because in the next few years, that whole picture is going to change. Um, and we are going to start to see the universe in a whole new way. The key to that is gravitational waves. So gravitational waves really are opening a new window into our universe. And in science, when you 
look at something completely new, whether it's looking at it more sensitively than you ever have before, or sort of opening up this whole new window, you're always guaranteed to learn amazing new things. And that's what we're trying to do with this project called NanoGrab. NanoGrab is a team of astronomers and physicists and engineers, um, data specialists, uh, education researchers from across the US and Canada. We have 15 institutions, and I show them just on the map here. You can see they're mostly located on the East Coast, but that we really are a national, international project. And like I said, we include undergraduates, uh, graduate students, postdoctoral researchers, uh, senior professors, and scientists. So this is a probably the most complete picture that we have of Nanograph collaboration, although it's grown since this picture was taken. Um, some of you guys might actually recognize the instrument in the background as being part of the 300-meter Arecibo telescope. So we had a meeting down there. And this is a pretty large um, collaboration. It might look like, but as far as collaborations go, it's not too big. And we all know each other and get to interact with each other a lot, which is a lot of fun. That so sort of tells you about what nanograv is. What are gravitational waves exactly? And what are we going to be able to learn by studying them? Well, to answer these types of questions, we really need to understand gravity. And so we're going to spend a good bit of time here talking about just what gravity is to a physicist and astronomer. So I'm going to actually ask someone who is here on the, uh, on the call with us, if they could just give us a definition of gravity. And I'm going to go ahead and open up my list of participants. And uh, Brandon, you're the first person on the list. So I was wondering, would you be willing to just sort of give us a definition for gravity in your own work? Uh, yes. Gravity would be when a massive object uh, pulls stuff into it. The, the bigger object pulls things closer to it. For instance, uh, the Earth pulls the moon closer to it because the Earth is bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good definition, and you hit on some key points there. It also works for density, too. Yep. So physicists usually think of gravity as a force that attracts two objects with mass, and I think that's basically what you're saying. It's an attractive force that pulls things together, and you were using the word that it attracts bigger things. Um, to be specific, Gravity depends on the mass of the object, so the amount of matter in the object. Um, yes. Not the physical size, it really matters so much for what the gravity is at a distance. Um, it's how much mass it has. And I put this little star next to the word usually because Einstein has given us another way of thinking of gravity beyond this idea of sort of an attractive force. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but first we're going to talk a little bit more about the history of how we came to understand gravity. I'll point out that this gravity does depend on both the mass and the distance, so those two quantities matter. But physicists, or I should say, what would have at the time been called natural philosophers, didn't always think of gravity in this way. So this is a picture, well, a, bust of a, a picture of a bust of Aristotle, who was, you know, of course, a very famous philosopher. And he believes that objects fell to the earth or floated to the sky because of the elements that they were made of. So mm -hmm. fire rose to the sky, and earth, or feather, fell to the surface. And you notice in my little animation there, I had the rock falling faster than the feather, which is sort of intuitively what we all experience in our everyday life. And in this ancient view of the universe, the heavens were the realm of light and fire, and the earth was the realm of stone and water. So light and fire naturally wanted to rise towards the heavens. Earth and uh, stone and water naturally wanted to fall towards the center of the earth. And this picture in the background is of a sort of descriptive um, view of what the ancient view of the universe actually was, with the earth at the center of the solar system being orbited by the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. They didn't think of these objects that we see in the night sky as being anything like the Earth. They were these ethereal um, you know, objects and bodies that were made of a different substance than what the Earth was. But of course, our understanding evolved. 
and probably one of the first people, or at least one of the first people that we know of, to apply evidence-based scientific reasoning to nature, actually going out and collecting information and trying to explain what you observe was Galileo Galilei, who I have in this picture here. And he advanced many ideas that ran counter to this Aristot Aristotelian and what can you call the Ptolemaic worldview after a Greek philosopher named Ptolemy. And of course, one of those ideas was that objects all fall at the same rate. So that if you were to drop something from the Tower of Pisa, a stone, and a feather, the only reason that the feather seems to fall more slowly is because of a familiar concept that we all know about now, which is air resistance. But if you were to go up into space on the moon, where there is no air resistance, and drop a feather in the rock, it would fall at exactly the same rate. And this is actually an experiment you can do if you have a, a tube that you can pump most of the air out of, and you can drop a feather and a penny, and you'll see them both fall at exactly the same rate. So this is sort of indicative that there was something common to the Earth, not to the object itself, that caused it to fall down to the Earth and, and, and the rate at which it fell. And the final piece of this puzzle came from Isaac Newton, who undeniably is one of the greatest scientists in history. And he realized that gravity could be described as a universal force that followed a very simple mathematical law. And of course, there's this famous story, prob probably not quite accurate, of uh, an apple falling on his head and him realizing that this was due to gravity. But really what it was is that he realized that a force that caused an apple to fall to the Earth was actually the same force that kept the moon in orbit around the Earth. And that this could apply universally beyond the Earth as well. And this was a real revolution to think about the universe as being you know, fundamentally no different than what life is like here on the Earth. So this is an actual quote um, from Newton, that the forces which keep the planets in their orbs must be reciprocally as the squares of their distances from the centers about which they revolve, and thereby compare the force requisite to keep them in the moon in her orb, the force of gravity at the surface of the Earth, that found up the answer pretty nearly. And of course, this is some slightly archaic 17th century language. So I kind of just rewrote that in language that I hope is a little bit easier to understand. And basically what he's saying is the same force that causes an apple to fall keeps the planets in the orbit. And its strength depends only on the mass of the two objects and their distance, technically so distance squared. And Newton's laws work really, really well. Explain the object, the motion of everyday objects with incredible precision. So if you have a time-lapse uh, image of a ball bouncing, and you apply Newton's laws um, to determine the path of the ball, you'll find that they agree exactly. It'll follow this sort of parabolic uh, form that has both horizontal and vertical motion. The existence of the planet Neptune was actually predicted using Newton's laws, they saw a discrepancy in the orbit of the planet Uranus based upon what Newton's laws are predicting, and they were able to tell that it was because of the gravitational influence of an undiscovered planet. They were even, even able to tell where to look for that planet in the night sky by studying the orbit of Uranus. This was a huge confirmation for uh, Newton's laws. And people talk about rocket science and how rocket science is very hard, and it, certainly it, it's not easy to launch a rocket into space, but the physical laws that you need to understand to launch a rocket into space and to reach a target hundreds of a million miles away are basically just Newton's laws. But by the late 1800s, scientists were starting to find situations in which Newton's laws didn't seem to work quite right. The most, most famous of these is the precession of a planet's orbit. And so I have this little uh, animation here on the screen showing what this concept of precession is. And basically it shows that in time, a planet will go around a body like the sun but the angle of the orbit will actually change. You can also think of this if you, if you set a top spinning and the top will kind of wobble. It's sort of a similar sort of thing going on there, although not for the same physical reason. And this is something that Newton's laws had a lot of uh, difficulty explaining. As you notice in the picture here, this is greatly exaggerated. This is not how it would actually uh, appear in real time, but it illustrates it. And this is is most obvious for the planet Mercury. So 
people were trying to understand what the situation was. Newton's laws are not wrong. We know that they you know, work very, very well in most situations, but it was becoming clear that they were not complete and that there was some other, uh, something else that we need to account for. The solution was, of course, very famously found by Einstein, and it completely changed our view of what gravity was and really what space and time were. So this theory is called Einstein's general theory of relativity, and it doesn't describe gravity as being an attractive, invisible force that pulls an object um, in one direction or another. Instead, it's geometrical. What we mean by that is that gravity is thought of as a distortion in space and time. And I want to be very clear about what I mean here. Space, in this concept, is not necessarily just outer space. Space is just the distance that exists between any two points. So it doesn't even have to be anything physically at those two points. We just care about how far apart they are and what the shortest distance really is between them. And when we talk about time, what we're talking about is that which is measured by clock, which is not the most satisfying definition for what time is, but it's actually pretty hard to come up with a definition of time that doesn't use the word time in the definition. So for our purposes here, we're just going to uh, call time something which is measured by the tick of a clock. Of course, this is the uh, sort of famous now view of what this concept of space-time is. Space-time unifies these ideas of, of a distortion in space and time. And we usually think about it as being like a sheet. And you have a massive object on a toxic pulled sheet. It will curve that sheet. And in the same way, um, massive objects will cause space-time to curve. I saw someone just raise their hand and had a question. I believe it was Timothy. Can you hear me? Yep. OK, um, I'm, I was just going to say that I've seen this particular illustration before, and I just want to clarify that those lines that are being distorted by the mass are not actual physical lines. It's bending in a dimension that we don't see in our four, our four dimensions, right? That is the bending of space-time, which doesn't actually look like that. Just, just right. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to get to this in just a second. Um, this is an analogy that takes our three-dimensional universe and tries to make it easier to visualize by representing it in two dimensions. So obviously, we don't live on a flat sheet. We live in a three-dimensional mm -hmm. universe. And I'll try and show you what a visualization of space-time is um, in that regard. But the lines that are drawn here are just sort of meant to guide the eye and represent the distance between any two points. So this is, this is illustrative, which is a good point. I got you. So basically how far the um, the depression is from where it would be is, is showing an increased um, actual value of the gravitational force? Yeah, that's exactly right. The stronger the gravity, the, the greater the distortion. OK. And okay. Good. this picture I got, um, because it looked really good, I'm not sure if, if you actually try to figure out the exact shape of the curvature, I'm not sure if it's precisely what Einstein's uh, equation would predict depending on whatever mass that little black ball is, but I think it looks it, it looks pretty good. So That's now while we're on excuse me for a second. Now while we're on this topic, um the theory of wormholes, it's where that sheet, that metaphorical sheet bends and you can cut through that bend into a pretty much another place. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so wormholes are sort of difficult to visualize in three dimensions. So they usually have the sheet kind of bending around, and then you make a tunnel between the two sides. And I don't have a picture of that. Um, and we're not going to talk too much about the concept of wormholes, but they are a possible prediction of the theory that we're not really sure if it actually has any physical implications. We don't know if these can actually exist, but mathematically, they look like they're, they're possible. So the, the key ideas here is that the more massive the object, the greater this curvature. And that gravity, gravity causes a distortion in both space and time. So it's not just that it's causing the distance between objects to change, but it's actually causing clocks to tick at different rates. And there are very strong gravitational fields, or in a very strong gravitational field. Time will actually move more slowly. And this has now been experimentally verified with very, very precise um, instruments, but also pulsars can uh, show this as well. And this explains 
quite naturally, why planets move in ellipses, because they are just taking the shortest path in a curved space, which isn't a straight line, it's a curve. This is actually something that I think everyone is familiar with, even if you haven't quite realized it. If you've ever looked at a map of how uh, planes travel between two different points, they don't seem to travel on straight lines on a map. They seem to travel in these curves, which are actually arcs of what we call a great circle, which is basically a circle that goes around um, the four. And so the reason that they look like curves is because they're following the, the shortest distance on this curved surface of the Earth. And this concept of the planets um, moving in ellipses is very similar to what you guys may see if you've ever done those little coin shoot sort of things that they have in, in stores sometimes. Um, and these coins will uh, move around. In this case, they fall down towards the center because there's friction, air resistance, and friction between the coin and the surface. But in space where there is no friction, causing the planets to lose energy, they just keep going around in these circular orbits or elliptical orbits. But um, this is just an analogy meant to sort of help you visualize things that works well enough for most purposes, but is not precise. And this is a, a one of my favorite comics from XKCD, which if any of you guys uh, are familiar with that, you'll know that it's a lot of fun. If not, it's, it's a good web comic to check out. Um, teacher is saying, understanding gravity, space time is like a rubber sheet. Massive objects distort the sheet, and says, they distort it because they're pulled down by what? And then the teacher throws up the Einstein field equation, and everyone goes boring. So we're not going to throw up the Einstein field equations, which are some complicated mathematics um, involving very high level math. But just keep in mind <laughs> that these aren't precise um, definitions here. These are sort of just helpful for visualization. If you wanted to depict what uh, time looked like in three dimensions, and hopefully this will uh, answer the, the question that Timothy had a little bit more, it might look a little something like this, where now, rather than bending a sheet down, sort of scrunching things around it. In this case, the lines are, again, meant to sort of represent the distance between points. And notice that the lines go through the Earth. We live in space-time. It's not a surface that we live on top of. We live in this concept of space-time. Because, again, it's just the distance between two points, the rate at which clocks tick. But it's not a substance. Okay? Space-time is not a substance. It's a way of describing distances. Okay. I got to get you a dentist appointment too. Um, can I ask um that everybody just mute their microphones or if they don't have a question to ask? Or, um, hearing uh, some background. Okay. And you can just find the mute button for your microphone in the corner of the WebEx window. Oh, it's more. Okay. So general relativity passed its first test by correcting, correctly predicting that light would follow a curved path near a very massive object. And so this was the very famous test, which during a solar eclipse, um, they looked for a star which should have appeared to be behind the sun, but actually appeared next to the sun because it was, the path was curved and we were able to see it. Um, the picture down at the bottom shows sort of uh, schematically what's going on, although the curvature is much, much uh, smaller than what's depicted there. And then the actual picture during the solar eclipse is shown in the left. This was uh, carried out by Frank Dyson and Sir Arthur Eddington in 1919. And you may not see a star in that picture, um, so it took a lot of uh, you know, careful analysis. Um, but in the end, it was found that uh, the deflection of the star, the position of the star by the sun's gravity matched what Einstein's uh, theories had predicted. And so this was the first uh, real experimental test of what was a very revolutionary idea. And I saw Timothy had a question again. Yeah, I don't want to slow us up. Um, and no, I, I, fine. Questions are good. I understand um, the actual theory of what's trying to be put forward, but could you explain the picture in the top left, what exactly we're, we're seeing like, what, what exactly the cur curvature is being portrayed as? Yeah, you mean the picture down here at the bottom? Uh, no, I mean the one on the top left, how exactly um, they could tell that... I mean, if you could just explain that in more depth, I'm kind of sure. like fuzz fuzzy on exactly what we're, I'm seeing in the top left corner. Sure, sure, sure. So this is just an actual photograph um, that was taken during solar eclipse. So here's the, the sun, it's being mapped out by the disk of the moon and you're seeing the solar corona. If anyone's ever seen a picture of a solar eclipse, um, a more recent one, then this picture will look somewhat familiar. 
And what they were basically looking for here was a star that its position relative to the other stars in the sky is known. Um, but the prediction is that when the sun gets near the star, the position of the star should appear to change slightly because the light is being bent and deflected slightly by the gravity of the sun. And it's a very similar concept um, in some ways to how light is bent coming out of water, so that if you, um, you know, let's say that you're a spear fisherman, I don't know if anyone's ever tried that, I have it personally, but uh, if you are, um, if you try and spear the fish where it appears to be, then you're gonna miss, because the light is actually being deflected and the fish is, appears to be in a different position than where it actually is under the water. And so you need to compensate for that when you try and spear your fish. Um, it's a very similar sort of thing here. The light is being bent by the gravity of the sun, and so the position of the star appears to change relative to the stars that are far away from the sun and, are, and whose light is not being deflected by its gravity. And so this is the original picture here. Again, it took some careful analysis. I'm not sure precisely where the star in the picture was. Um, you can see a couple things that look like stars here, but again, this is 1919, so I'm not sure how much of this was uh, artifacts of the photograph. But that's what they were actually looking for, was an apparent shift in the position of the star. And the reason they had to wait for a solar eclipse is because when the sun was out, you wouldn't actually be able to see the stars against the brightness of the sun. Does that answer your question? I, I believe so. It, my question wasn't really all that, I guess, important. I was just trying to understand what exactly they were looking for. But you answered my question what, for why they need a solar, solar eclipse. And right. I'm, guess, I'm guessing they're looking for um, a visual representation for the star that is different from the one they know it to be mathematically. Is that what I'm, am I correct in that? Well, it's, it's more um, that they were looking, so if you go out and you look at night and you map where the stars are, um, you can measure their positions relative to each other and you, on, on some coordinate system. We Technically, we call mm -hmm. that right ascension declination, but it's very similar to latitude and longitude on the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when the, the sun is in the opposite part of the sky. And so the gravity of the sun is not deflecting the light from the star. I see, so I get the it. Sun is, and the star appear to be close together in the sky, the light from the star is being deflected by the sun, and you're seeing an apparent change in the position of that star relative to the other stars around it, and that's what they were trying to measure and did measure. I see. Okay. I got it. I'm good. Great. And the uh, questions are fine. Um, please don't hesitate to ask. Okay. So since then, the predictions of general relativity have been tested many, many times with incredible precision. Uh, pulsars have been used in particular for many of these tests. And each time, general relativity has passed those tests with really amazing accuracy. We have still not found a place where general relativity appears to break down in the same way that we are able to find um, places where Newton's laws of gravity did break down. Now we can start to answer this question of what gravitational waves are. And so we're gonna go back and we're gonna use that visualization, remember it's an imperfect visualization, but we're gonna use it anyway, of the sheet um, that represents space-time. And in that visualization, you can think of gravitational waves as distortions of this sheet of space-time, and these gravitational waves travel out and they repeat. That's what makes them waves, the fact that they repeat in some fashion. And it's basically very similar to the ripples on the surface of a pond. And so you can think of them as being ripples in space-time. And so here is sort of a, uh, a visualization of what that would look like. In this case, we have two black holes which are orbiting each other, and that's what's causing these gravitational waves. This is a prediction of general relativity that when certain configurations of mass accelerate, they will create gravitational waves. Um, a perfectly spinning, you know, a perfect sphere which is just spinning is not going to create gravitational waves um, in sort of the same way that if you had a perfectly smooth ball of some sort floating in a pond and you spun it, it wouldn't really create very many waves. Um, but if you had a dumbbell shape where the uh, two ends were offset from each other, that would create waves in the pond and in the same way, um, that type of a uh, configuration of mass, which is represented here by the two black holes, can create gravitational waves. And they should, according to Einstein's theory of uh, relativity, travel outward from the, from the object at the speed of light. Uh, yeah, another question? 
yeah, is, is there a, an easy explanation for why gravitational waves travel the speed of light? Or is, is that just because there are waves and m m like many natural uh, constants travel the same speed as the, uh, a light wave? Yeah, so it has to do with basically what we call the messenger particle. And this is starting to get into a different, different realm than what we're going to really talk about here. But just briefly, we can describe forces in quantum mechanics as being uh, carried by particles. The, we call these messenger particles. Photons are the messenger particles for the electromagnetic force, and, and they also happen to be um, what, what carries light. And so that's something that people are typically familiar with. And basically, if you uh, look at the theories of, uh, of general relativity, you can determine you know, how fast something is going to move based upon sort of the properties of whether or not it's massive. Uh, Photons, and in the case of gravity, something that we think are called gra gravitons, are massless, and so as a consequence, they travel at the speed of light. Got it. The actual effect of a gravitational wave, let's say the one is passing through you, is going to be a shrinking and a stretching of space time. And so the little animation here on the right shows these particles which if there was no gravitational waves, they would just be two circles, evenly spaced. But as this gravitational wave passes through, it causes them to shrink in one direction and stretch in the other. And it causes a change in the relative length of the objects, or relative, um, a relative change in the distance between any two points. And so that's what a gravitational wave observationally would look like. And if, gravitation, excuse me, if gravitational waves were very strong, you could just set out um, some of these what we call test particles, um, they, would be, they would not have to be being affected by other forces. Um, so you could put them out in space and let them in, um, stay in free fall. And you would actually be able to see this uh, deviation here. But in fact, gravitational waves are not, uh, well, I was ask a question about that later, but we'll see just how weak they are and how small they are in just a second. So gravitational waves have never been directly observed. Never, we've never directly observed that actual shrinking and stretching of space time, but we have very good indirect evidence for their existence. Gravitational waves should carry energy away from a system. And we've actually seen this uh, observationally as binary neutron stars, in this case it was a pulsar and a neutron star. Um, the distance between those two objects, the orbits around each other, uh, shrinks. And using a technique called pulsar time, technique called pulsar timing, we can measure this. And this is a kind of a, a technical plot, but we just have here um, in fancy, this is fancy language for basically how far apart the objects are um, from some baseline. So we're 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 calling a zero here just the reference point. They're not actually um, separated by zero distance there. And this is time in years, and we actually can measure that they're getting closer and closer together as time goes on. Um, and this, these, data, these black dots are the actual data points. They ha there are error bars on those data points, but they're so small you can't actually see them. And the black line is the prediction of general relativity. It's not a fit to the data. It's just the prediction of general relativity. And you can see that it matches exactly. And for this particular uh, system here, this was um, the most uh, precise test of general relativity at the time and actually won the Nobel Prize in 1993 for this experiment. We think that lots of objects should be emitting gravitational waves right now throughout the universe. And many of these objects, we don't think will, be, will emit any detectable light, or they may not emit any light at all, uh, such as, for example, black holes. And so gravitational waves may be the only way that we have to learn about them. And this is really what makes the study of gravitational waves so far powerful. And what I mean when I say that they're opening a new window on the universe. Now, this uh, hopefully will bring up a question in your mind, which is that if we think that there's all these gravitational waves being emitted by objects that, uh, throughout the universe and are passing through this room right now, why aren't we actually shrinking and stretching the same way that we saw those uh, little test particles on the slide a couple ways back? Um, does anybody want to uh, try and, and take a guess? Um, I could. I could hazard a guess. Yeah, have a guess. Is it because we are actually shrinking and stretching, but relative to ourselves, we can't notice it? Or is it the actual speed ah. that's happening? So that is a very good uh, point, that if you're trying to use the ruler to measure 
how much you're shrinking and stretching, the ruler is shrinking and stretching too. So that's an excellent point. You need to have um, a different, what we call differential measurement. Um, and there are ways that we can, that we can do that. Um, it happens, so it happens that the shrinking in one direction uh, and the stretching in the other direction happen perpendicular to each other. So we can measure it that way. And so there is that, that uh, slight complication, which is an excellent, excellent observation. Um, but the other uh, reason is that gravitational waves are really, really, really weak. Really weak. And I kind of alluded to this earlier. Um, you would expect a range of different strengths for gravitational waves. But let's just take it, what we would say is maybe a typical uh, strength for gravitational wave that would be passing uh, through us right now. The expected change in the height of a typical person is going to be less than one atom. Okay? So how do you measure something like that? I mean, it's extremely, extremely difficult. And again, this is, you know, there's some gravitational waves are going to be a little stronger, depending on how close you are. But this is sort of just, it gives you a sense of what might be typical uh, for sources that are passing through the Earth. And I thought someone else had a question. Yes. So if you were closer to, like, let's say a black hole, I know you wouldn't get very close to them, but would the gravitational waves be stronger there? Yeah, the gravitational waves, the the... the the strength of gravitational waves um, would be stronger. Um, I don't know exactly how much stronger though. So it would, it would go as the distance. I think I think it was well. I'll just say that um, they would be stronger, um, but they probably still would be. Uh, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Maybe. Okay. Another question, Timothy. Yeah, it was just a related question. Do black holes carry mass, and is that why they attract gravity? Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Black holes carry mass. And th so, as they take in more mass, does their mass increase? Yep. So, if a black hole swallows a star, it gains the mass of that star. Exactly. And I'm trying to remember the name of the point, but all of that mass goes into an infinitesimally small uh, point. Right. We call that singularity. Singularity. And how is that physically possible? Well, that's a good question, and that involves physics that we don't quite understand yet. It requires a, uh, a melding of quantum physics and general relativity, and those two theories seem to be incompatible based uh, upon our current understanding. And so this is actually an active area of research. One of the ways that people are trying to unify these theories is through uh, string theory, for example. Um, how, how would string theory pose a solution? Um, well, one of the things is that, you, as you said, it, general relativity predicts that things would um, fall to an infinitesimally small point. Um, but, you know, a, a point of zero size isn't really physical. Um, so string theory, um, which posits that, you know, all, all particles, all, you know, everything in the universe is, is made up of these str uh, strings of energy that have some sort of a finite length, which sort of provide, I guess, a, a scale below which... Um, you know, the singularity nature would no longer matter. Um, but it's still an active area of research, that for sure. I understand. Yep. So, another bigger question is, if gravitational waves are so, uh, so small, how could we ever hope to actually measure them? And there are several different techniques, but nanograv is using pulsars. So now we're going to get back into pulsars. I know that a lot of you guys already are familiar with pulsars, but we're just going to go ahead and... Uh, do a very brief overview. This is the typical picture of a pulsar everyone shows. You have a neutron star at the center. It's the remains of a dead star that was more massive than our sun to end its life at a supernova. They have these extremely strong magnetic fields. They spin very, very quickly. In the case of the fastest millisecond pulsars, they spin hundreds of times a second. And they emit beams of radio waves from these magnetic poles. So we think of them as these interstellar lighthouses. And each time that the radio beam tw points towards the Earth, we see a pulse of radio waves, and that's where their name comes from. It's really more of a flash um, in some sense, but the name has stuck. And so as many of you guys already know, pulsars are some of the most extreme objects in the entire universe. Um, they have a typical mass of about uh, half a million Earth masses, but it's squeezed into a size, which is the region of a large city like Manhattan. And the equivalent density is like squeezing the entire population of the Earth into the size of a sugar cube. Um, which may 
basically makes them like city sized atomic nuclei in terms of the advanced density. They have um, gravity, which is actually approaching pretty close to that of a black hole at their surface, and they're spinning as fast as a kitchen blender. Magnetic fields are um, into quadrillion times stronger than man made magnets, the strongest man, mag man made magnets that we, can, that we have. And if you were to put a pulsar at the distance of the moon, of the moon, uh, the gravity of having something that that mass is so nearby would rip the Earth apart. But the magnetic field would also erase all of the computer hard drives and credit cards on the Earth because it's so strong. So the very extreme object. Of course, there's a special class of pulsars called millisecond pulsars that spin incredibly fast, hundreds of times a second, and they tick. If you want to think of each pulse that we see as a tick on a clock, which is exactly how we're going to think of them, then the stability of that tick rivals that of an atomic clock. And so it's like having an atomic clock in some of the most extreme environments that we find in the universe. And they're great tools for studying a wide range of physics for exactly that reason. And again, because of this clock-like nature. This is an example to give you a sense of how precise that is. At 5.30 p.m., which we did a little bit, uh, a little bit ago now, maybe like 10 minutes. On May 5th, 2013, the period of the millisecond pulsar J0437-4715, which is the pulsar with the most precise uh, measured rotational period, is or was 0.00575745193737 seconds plus minus. And so all of those digits are significant. You guys have talked about significant digits in school yet. You know, you don't just keep quoting decimal precision out to some arbitrary value, but that's the actual uncertainty on that measured period. They're incredibly precise. And the idea for using them to detect gravitational waves is actually pretty similar to that of global positioning systems. So the global positioning system works by having a network of satellites surrounding the Earth that basically transmit a signal that we can use to determine uh, their location relative to, to some uh, receiver, so the GPS in your car, for example. By using this network of satellites, we can tell with very high accuracy where you are on the Earth. The tips of the pulsars let us use them kind of like a cosmic global positioning system. We can actually measure tiny changes um, on the Earth or at the telescope that we use to measure them by observing pulsars. And so this is the schematic for what we call a pulsar timing array. And this is what we're trying to use to detect gravitational waves. The gravitational wave, which is passing by the Earth, is going to call us, cause a small change in the apparent rate at which a pulsar ticks. And it's going to be related to where the pulsars are on the sky relative to the Earth. Be sure that this apparent change in which the pulse rate at which the pulsar is ticking is real, we look for a what we call a correlated effect between many different millisecond pulsars. So if we only saw it in one pulsar, you might say, well maybe the pulsar is just doing something strange. But if we see the same effect in a correlated way among many, many pulsars, then we can say that aha, this is something which is not just intrinsic to any one pulsar, and depending on the form of this apparent change in the in the tick of the pulsar, we can actually say that this is almost certainly a gravitational wave because gravitational waves are predicted to have a very specific signal. And we call this concept a pulsar timing array. So this is basically what nanograv is trying to do, trying to measure this effect of gravitational waves on the Earth using pulsars. And to do this, they use the two of the world's best telescopes. This is a picture of the Arecibo telescope. You'll recognize maybe from the picture earlier from the nanograv meeting the receiver uh, housing up here. This is a 300 meter diameter telescope, so it's the size of three football fields from one end to the other, located in Puerto Rico. And this is the world's largest radio telescope um, and the, I should say, single dish radio telescope anyway. And it is the world's most sensitive radio telescope. But it can only look straight up and a little bit from side to side. It's so big that you can't move the whole dish around. It sort of sits in this depression in the ground. So for the part
to the sky that you can see, this is one of the best telescopes in the world, it's not the best, but you can't see the whole sky. The entire sky, we use the 100 meter Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, which is a, another telescope that many of you guys will be very familiar with. This is the world's largest fully steerable telescope. Um, it's 100 meters in diameter, uh, so a third of uh, the diameter of Arecibo. But again, we can now point it anywhere in the sky. And this just gives you a sense down here in the uh, lower right hand corner of just how big this is compared to some other. Uh, common sort of uh, monuments that we see. So this is a really wonderful facility as well. Some of you guys may know that the future of the GBT is actually uh, in jeopardy along with that of several other telescopes. Um, a recent review of the National Science Foundation budget, which ultimately uh, supports the Green Bank Telescope, recommended that the NSF divest is the technical term from the GBT, which basically means that they would no longer provide funding. Um, simply because the budget situation is very tight, and there's lots of new instruments that are coming online that people want to make sure that there's funding support. Um, the GVT is really critical to NANOGRAB. We wouldn't be able to be successful as quickly as we want to be without it. It's a really important instrument for us. And we're looking for other sources of funding. And you can help by simply supporting funding for all types of basic research, uh, particularly in astronomy. We don't, you know, we want to save GVT, but what we would really like to do is the funding for basic science increased overall. And so if you want to learn more, you can actually visit this uh, savegbt.org website, and you can learn more about how you can help. All right, getting back to the actual detection of gravitational waves now, the signals that we are trying to detect, as we said, are very weak. So we need lots of high precision MSPs. And this is one of the, the great ways that PFC and ARC are helping us. We want to find new millisecond pulsars, um, and we want to find very precise millisecond pulsars. That is one of the best ways that we can improve our sensitivity to gravitational waves, by finding more of these high-precision millisecond pulsars. And so a lot of effort is going in searching and finding pulsars, and a lot of the students um, who are helping us with these projects are, are, you know, have actually found MSPs, and I believe one that uh, possibly needs more uh, you know, some of the ARC students, um, so there's even more than just one, that have actually gone into uh, the, this uh, pulsar timing array for NanoGrab um, and an international effort as well. So you guys are definitely helping us um, in this project by finding these pulsars. Uh, but it's not just finding more pulsars, we also need to understand them in great detail because there's other signals that, you know, might be stronger than the gravitational waves in the pulsar timing data, and we, we need to be able to correct for those somehow. So we need to understand the pulsars themselves. We need to understand the stability of the pulsars and what they're doing. We need to understand interstellar weather. A lot of people think that space is empty, but space is actually filled with a plasma of electrons. And this affects the signal of the pulsar. It's not a very dense plasma, but it's enough that it affects the signal from the pulsars. And it has weather patterns, effectively. Um, you know, pockets of higher density and lower density that cause changes in the signal over time. We need to understand that. We also need to have very precise instruments. We need to understand what our instruments are doing. And these are all active areas of research within NanoGrav. And NanoGrav is not the only project trying to do this. Um, to try and make uh, detection more quickly, NanoGrav has partnered with the pulse, uh, with pulsar timing arrays in Europe and Australia, uh, called the, Par the Parks Pulsar Timing Array for the Parks Telescope in Australia, and the European Pulsar Timing Array. And together, we form a global collaboration of scientists and, and, and physicists and engineers and, and data specialists called the International Pulsar Timing Array, or the IPTA. And then finally, we need time to build sensitivity to weak gravitational waves. The more time that we collect data, the more sensitive that we become to the signal. And in fact, we become sensitive to different types of signals, which might actually be even stronger. And so time is the other crucial ingredient. But we believe, optimistically, we hope, in five to ten years, we will have successfully detected gravitational waves using, uh, using a pulsar timing array. But detection is only the first step. We want to do more than just detect these gravitational waves directly. So what sorts of things will we discover? Well, one thing, merging supermassive black holes, 
I have a little video here that is going to show what this uh, the merger of two supermassive black holes at the center of the galaxy uh, would look like, um, showing also trying to show the effects of the gravitational waves. So we predict that there should be, at the centers of galaxies which have just recently merged, which is actually not what's shown in this picture, uh, two supermassive black holes at the center. And they eventually, we think, should collide to form one even bigger black hole. And as they do, they're going to emit gravitational waves, which is what you're uh, seeing here. That's the distortions in the image. Until finally they would merge together and possibly then emit a signal in electromagnetic waves as well that we, can, that we might also be able to detect. And I'll just show that one more time. Pretty interesting video. Again, we're sort of zooming into a picture of, this is an actual picture of a galaxy, but uh, this is just simulated data. We see that these uh, black holes are surrounded by disks of gas, called accretion disks. They have jets coming out of them. But here you start to see the gravitational wave um, being emitted as well in this image or this video. And then the, the black holes merge together, and there's the potential of electromagnetic counterparts that we would also like to detect. So that's one potential source of gravitational waves that we hope to study. Another is gravitational waves from the very beginning of the universe. Our current understanding of the Big Bang, which is the, the current best model that we have for um, explaining how the universe came into existence, predicts a period that's called inflation. And during this inflationary period that happened very tiny fractions of a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have grown exponentially. Um, the actual expansion of space would have occurred even faster than the speed of light. Um, which you might say, oh, I thought things could travel faster than the speed of light. Um, the key here is that space itself can expand faster than light, but no information can be carried between those two points that are moving apart because they're moving apart faster than light. And, and you cannot transmit information faster than the speed of light. That is the, the key sort of speed limit there. And we should be able to detect relics of this inflationary period in gravitational waves, which would be a great tool for understanding what the uh, physics of this inflationary period is like, if it even happens. We don't. You know, we have some very good reasons to believe that inflation happened, but this could be a, uh, you know, a great observational confirmation um, of that that would be really, really powerful. And there are some theories of quantum mechanics and string theories that predict the existence of, of something called cosmic strings. And these are very, very large and extent um, regions of space-time that are basically wound up very, very tightly. And they have an incredible effective mass, or, or be more precise, energy density. And pulsar time arrays may be one of the best ways to detect and to test these ideas. We don't know if these types of cosmic strings actually exist, but it's, uh, it's a the prediction of some theories, and so uh, pulsar timing arrays could be a great uh, either confirmation or uh, um, uh, proof that they don't that they that they don't exist. And that's all. Timothy has uh, raised a hand. Yeah. Do you mind me asking about uh, cosmic strings for a sec? No. Go ahead. So, it, are cosmic strings along the same lines of string theory, where there's extra dimensions to house the the, the strings themselves, or is this certain pockets of space-time, like different like places in the universe where this is an anomaly? Yeah, so I think that they may be um, a con certain certain string theories might predict the existence of cosmic strings, but they're not the same thing as those little tiny vibrations of energy that make up subatomic particles. They're more akin to uh, pockets, like you were saying. Um, although they would they would be very very uh, large in one dimension, they would be very long in one dimension, but they would be basically almost one dimensional um, around, so almost like a line of very very high energy density. Um, the technical term would be a, a topological defect. So it's almost like someone took that that fabric of space time and wound it very very tightly um, along one dimension, um, creating what 
it effectively is a very large mass. Um, I don't know if it has exactly something to do with the extra dimensions or not, um, but we have a, a person in Nanograph who is an expert on these dot cosmic strings, and so maybe we can try and get, have him give a talk to you guys, and he can tell you a little bit more about them, because it's not something I'm not super familiar with. Yeah, that sounds very interesting, because it seems almost like kind of a ray. If you're saying it's only in one dimension, it seems like it's a ray of contacted space-time, which I have absolutely no idea where that would come from. So I'd be interested. Yeah, but I think that, I think that that's probably a pretty good way of, of visualizing it. Um, yeah, but where how that forms is another whole other question. So I understand. Thank you. Yep. But I think one of the most exciting possibilities for pulsar timing arrays is the things that we don't know about and don't even have predictions for, because throughout the history of science, every time we've opened up new frontiers, we have you know found amazing new things that we weren't predicting. And I think that with gravitational waves, we're going to see things that we didn't predict as well. And that's going to be very, very cool. Now, Nanograv and the International Pulsar Timing Array are not the only experiments that are trying to detect gravitational waves. Uh, there's an experiment called LIGO. It has two locations, one in Louisiana and one in Washington State. And it's using lasers to try and measure the distance between two points on these arms, these perpendicular arms, that are many kilometers long. And this is an actual picture of the LIGO site in Louisiana. So hopefully you guys can see my mouse cursor here. And there's one arm that goes off in this direction towards sort of the upper left of the picture, and another arm which goes off in this direction towards the right. And there's these lasers that get bounced back and forth between these cavities. And basically, I, uh, I'm looking at how these, these lasers, the light from the lasers, constructively or destructively interfere with each other. And this has to do with the wave nature of light. We can measure the, the, the length of these arms very, very precisely. Because they're perpendicular to each other, we have this differential measurement between the, the two arms. Um, and we can uh, hopefully detect gravitational waves that way. But they are sensitive to different sources of gravitational waves and pulsar timing arrays. And so they're doing complementary science. Um, certainly, LIGO and its uh, you know, sort of, uh, similar projects in Europe called Virgo and GEO and this one in uh, Japan, I believe, called uh, Tama. Um, they would love to make the first detection of gravitational waves so with the, the people in the pulsar timing array community. That would be really cool. But no matter who makes the first detection, we're going to be studying different things. And so the, the types of science we're doing are complementary to each other. This is just, again, saying that when we do make this first detection, it's going to start a whole new era of astronomy and of our study of the universe that I think is going to be very, very exciting. And of course, this is something that you guys are already very familiar with. You can help with this. Um, there are already students on, on the call here that are in the Pulsar Search Collaboratory and the Arecibo Remote Command Center um, that help us search for pulsars. Uh, some of you guys may also be aware of a program called Einstein at Home, which you can download basically a little uh, app for your computer that runs in the background, similar to the Steady at Home project, that helps to analyze pulsar data and help find pulsars just using spare cycles on your CPU. And that's a very uh, you know, useful project that you can basically do with just a few clicks of a button and then just let it run on your computer. It doesn't take any more work than that. And of course, vocally supporting funding for basic scientific research is, is a, is a you know, another great way to help because you know, these projects, uh, I think, have really great value. They're, they're not very expensive in, in the grand scheme of, of you know, national budgets and that sort of thing, but funding situation is tight. Um, so we can always uh, use more support for that. This is just sort of my last slide here to summarize. You know, I think this is one of the most exciting times in astronomy um, because we are going to be starting off in this new era. And nanograbs and other projects like it are on the verge of opening up this whole new way of looking at the universe. And I think that when we do that, over the next few decades, we're going to learn some amazing things. And we're also going to have some really awesome surprises. And so I'll say thank you. You can learn more uh, by visiting any of these websites, nanograb.org, ipta4gw.org. I encourage any of you guys who want to to follow Nanograb and the IPTA on Facebook. This is a great way to stay very up to date with whatever is going on in the project. We have podcasts 
that we're recording, YouTube videos that are instructional. We uh, like to post links to interesting stories that we find. You can follow us there. Einstein at home.org. And of course, you guys are already familiar with Pulsar Search Collaboratory and ARC. And then I have the same GBT.org website up there as well. And then again, just finally, um, we really appreciate if you guys give us feedback about this talk and about future uh, seminars. And so I will, I will post this link um, again in the chat window. Uh, for anyone who came in late. But we'd really appreciate it if you could go and uh, click on this link, take a few minutes to fill out the survey, and let us know um, when you thought of this. And we look forward to doing these again in the future. So I will uh, go ahead and put up the slide with the websites for you here. And then I'll say thank you. And if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. One about uh, funding. My mom is a my mom is a um, scientific researcher, and she has been for a long time. And she let me know that I think the government, or at least our government, the United States, has passed um, new legislative reform in funding for science. That it's it's a democratic process. Now, between like all, all the researchers potentially receiving uh, grant money, and she said that because of that, there's a, um, a very high chance that theoretical science will fall by the wayside in the face of practical science like biomedical uh, mm -hmm. technologies and such like that. Is this like is this true? A and B, what can be done to kind of maybe ease the blow on theoretical science research? Sure. So. I don't know a whole lot about the, the upper level discussions in government about what direction funding is going to go on. And of course, those things always change. So I don't want to say anything firmly. Um, but there certainly, I think, is an attitude that we want to be supporting science that has practical applications. And one of the questions that people will always ask uh, as an astronomer is, well, this is all really interesting, but, but what does it matter? How does it affect my life? And this is a really a question, a larger question about what we call basic research in general. Basic research is, basic, is research that isn't done for a specific application. Um, at least that's not the primary reason. It's really done for curiosity's sake. But that doesn't mean that basic research doesn't have value, because it really is the foundation upon which applied research um, is built. And basic research can lead to amazing discoveries that have huge impact, uh, wireless internet is something that actually came out of basic research in, uh, in Australia by radio astronomers. Um, and of course, the modern technology that we enjoy today would absolutely not exist if it wasn't for our understanding of quantum mechanics and general relativity. But at the time that general relativity and quantum mechanics were first being developed, they were not trying to think of ways to build computers and microchips or GPS. They were just trying to answer basic questions about how the universe works. It was curiosity driven. And it was only after those revolutionary discoveries were made that people started to really realize just how much of an impact this could have practically. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, probably would be very difficult, maybe even impossible to measure the actual impact that you know, those two pillars of modern physics have had. So this is sort of the shining example, but um, you can find others. And I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that it's not always clear where the next great discovery is going to come from. So, you know, early researchers in quantum mechanics were studying the light that is emitted by gases in vacuum tubes when you pass electrical current through them. And that may not necessarily sound like something which is all that amazing and interesting at first, but the implications ended up being, you know, world changing. So I think it's really important to support a wide range of basic research because, again, it forms that foundation upon which uh, applied research is built. And you know, it, it can have far-reaching consequences that you couldn't predict ahead of time. At the same time, it's important to, to you know, be selective about the types of projects you fund. Um, you don't just want to be throwing uh, valuable resources at anything that comes your way. And that's why in basic research, we have a competitive process. So if you want to uh, you know, fund a project, you have to apply for funding. And then people ask, OK, what kind of science are you doing? 
you know, what is your track record for success? Do you have a good plan for, for you know, achieving the goals of your project? You know, are these types of goals things that people are interested in? And so it is a competitive pro process, and there is a certain democratic nature to it in that regard. But I think it's really important to continue to fund uh, these types of things in a responsible way. In terms of how you can increase funding, um, you know, since most funding does come from uh, government sources, Obviously, uh, you know, the way you vote and getting in touch with uh, representatives and senators um, is, is very important. Um, there's also foundations, private foundations, um, that support uh, basic research. Um, a lot of the times these are set up by, you know, wealthy philanthropists. But you can still just sort of show support for the sciences in general by telling your friends about what's going on and just trying to remind everyone how important this type of research is, and, and, and that it is worth doing. And just that attitude alone, I think, is one of the most important things that, that you can do, is just to contribute to an appreciation for, for science in general and for research that is curiosity-driven. So if I understand... At the end of my, my, my little uh, soapbox there. <laughs> no, it, well, it, good point. Well taken. Um, I, I, so if I understand correctly, um, governments, um, private institutions, and private funders are the major sources of funding for um, for basic research. Or are there, well, are there other sources? From different sources? You know, private companies do fund basic research, um, although I think maybe not as much as they used to. Most of the funding does come from uh, organizations like the National Science Foundation and NASA, at least in astronomy, and then there's other um, funding organizations as well. And then there are, you know, private organizations that fund basic research too, um, sort of private foundations. Um, so it, it comes from a variety of different sources. So we are definitely very heavily reliant on public funding. Uh, one last question before I shut up. Um, is there a chance I could get hold of A, the basic presentation, just a slide, and B, the video itself at some point? Um, sure. So we are recording this, and the video will be posted somewhere. We'll probably post it on our YouTube channel, and we'll link to that on the Facebook page, and I'll also send an email around. Um, but I can also uh, make sure that the, the slides are made available on our website, and then people can download them from there. And I will uh, post about that in the Facebook page, and I'll also send an email around to the uh, Pulse Research Collaboratory and the ARC so that people have that direct link too. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I enjoyed yeah. the presentation. Thank you. Are there any I other did. questions before we wrap up? I have a question. Sure. Uh, earlier in the presentation, you showed the different facilities like Penn State that had a nanograph, like they were like in correlate in, like were a part of it. If you're like an incoming student to Penn State, I'm a uh, senior right now in high school where I'm going to Penn State. Great. Is there a way we can, uh, like, participate if we're going into Penn State? Or yeah, is that something we want to go to the level? No, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so I put up the, uh, the list of institutions again here. So if anyone is, is uh, going to any of these schools, um, you can go to our NanoGrav webpage, nanograv.org, and there is a list of the researchers who are involved in the project along with the institution. Um, the, the senior scientist at Penn State who's involved with us is named Sam Finn. And you can find his email and uh, contact him and uh, see about uh, getting involved with some of the work that we're doing. Uh, we'd love to have undergraduate partic participation. And in fact, as part of this international pulse or timing array, there are opportunities for people to travel abroad and study with people in Europe and Australia and it, it can be a really great experience. Um, you know, we've had some of the students, uh, Joey Martinez, so I think might still be on, um, traveled to Germany, and I think he's going back again. And I'll just also say, I went to Penn State for my undergrad, so I'm always happy to see people go in there, too. So that's great. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. We love to see people getting excited about this and wanting to get involved. So we're really happy that, uh, that you're interested. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm happy to answer anything that I have an answer for. 
is there a chance that other um, institutions could jump on board with this? And like, if so, how does that happen? Does it typically happen through a faculty who's interested in it, or is there a way a student could maybe start a collaboration? It typically is a uh, faculty member who's sort of a senior representative, and then they'll have students working with them. NANOGRAPH has an open membership policy, so anyone can apply for membership. Um, they just have to sort of describe how they're going to contribute to the project, and then the members um, you know, have an opportunity to either accept the membership, a membership application um, or, or not. Um, and so we are open to other institutions. Um, it's a relatively small network of people, though, that, that are working on these types of things. And we are always looking for new people um, and, and happy for people who, to accept people who can contribute. Um, but it is a, a relatively small community, too. Um, but yeah, if, if, if I would encourage anyone to, you know, if they're going to a particular uh, university or college, to you know, try and find somebody who is doing the types of research that you are interested in. And remember that even if you go to a school that may not have uh, someone who's doing nanograv research, there are programs that uh, you can take advantage of to travel to a number of different uh, places, uh, in particular something called Research um, Experiences for Undergraduates, or REU. And this is a great program that you can go and do research for a summer at any number of different places, including some places that have uh, nanograv astronomers. And you can apply to work with someone for a summer and do a summer project with them. And it doesn't matter where you're going to school, you can, anyone can apply for uh, one of these REU grants. So that's something else that you could look into. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? All right. Well, in that case, I want to thank everyone again for uh, tuning in. We're going to have another one of these uh, seminars probably within the next few weeks here. Um, we'll probably usually have them on Mondays. Uh, there was a conflict yesterday, or, or rather tomorrow, that we uh, weren't able to do it. Um, I understand that that's when some of the PSD uh, seminars have typically been. But uh, we'll be flexible on the time, so we'll see who can attend and when. And I hope that you guys will tune in for that. I hope you guys will, uh, you know, Tell your friends to, to sign up as well. And again, thank you for joining in. You guys had a lot of great questions, and I really enjoyed doing this.